Speaking of videos, okay, we're going to pretend. Do you tell me when? No, hold on. What we're going to do is everybody start laughing really loud when he says go, like I just told a really funny joke. Are we, we're rolling now? Well, now you blew my whole plan. <laughs> Great. All right. This is how to run an open source hardware company with Lady Ada and uh, Philip Tyrone um, of Make Magazine. I don't know if you uh, have picked up a copy of this, but it's a fantastic magazine. Uh, I like to call it things I wish I could be doing instead of going to work. Uh, there's some fantastic projects in there. Um, but uh, let's give these guys a round of applause. OK, thank you for coming out this early morning. Um, that's a good sign. Uh, the challenge of business is uh, most of the time just showing up. That's our talk. Goodbye. No. Um, <laughs> So uh, I'm Phil Tyrone. I'm creative director of Adafruit Industries, and I'm also senior editor of Make Magazine. I'm Lamore, uh, I'm Lamore Freed, also known as Lady Ada, and I'm the owner and engineer at Adafruit Industries, where we make open source hardware and sell it. And so today, um, our talk is going to be about how to run an open source hardware business. And we're going to, um, the phrase is like, lift a kimono or whatever. We're going to show you uh, from kind of start to, or top to bottom how we run a company. We're also going to talk a little bit about open source hardware. Um, how many people here do electronics or, or build kits? Well, do some clapping so they can hear it on the video too. Yeah. OK, great. That's good. And uh, how many of you have uh, either bought or are aware of open source hardware? OK, all right. This is a good crowd. It's going to be pretty easy. Um, so first, what we always like to do is start out and talk about what open source hardware is. And uh, the big announcement that happened like 48 hours ago is we have an open source hardware definition. So just like there was an open source software definition that everyone agreed on, we're getting close to that with open source hardware. So the definition is now at 0.3. And in September, there is a Maker Faire New York City at the World's Fairground. We're taking over the World's Fairground just like people used to in like the 30s when we had video phones. We got video phones again. Um, sometimes they work. Um, and uh, we're going to make the, the final like 1.0 um, announcement there. And then after that, you'll see licenses. And that's one of the things that um, we'll talk about in a bit. But um, we like to talk about open source hardware in kind of uh, three chunks. And uh, Lamar's going to talk about that now. And this is basically what it is um, as far as a designer and a manufacturer is concerned. Um, so uh, we're just going to just go quickly over like what open source hardware is. Open source hardware, I mean, I'm sure all you guys know what open source software is, right? You're here at this hacker conference. And um, basically, open source hardware is, is very similar. There are a couple legal differences about, you know, patents versus copyrights and, you know, mask rights and stuff. But for the most part, the idea is the same. You want to have a design for a project and release it in a way that anyone else is allowed to make it without restriction. Um, so this is just um, sort of an adaptation of the open source definition, which I guess Bruce Perrins worked on. Um, he emailed us to make sure we knew. Um, and you know, it's, it's just a bunch of text. And you, know, it's, you may want attribution. Um, you might want something like share alike, the Creative Commons um, license definition, where you know, if I release something under um, a Creative Commons license, you also you can't make modifications and then keep them to yourself. Um, and then the only things that are slightly different is because um, open source hardware is manufactured, uh, one of the things that a lot of the companies that make open source hardware wanted to make sure of is we put in a clause that um, made sure that people didn't, you know, that there was a clause for trademarks because they're more important in hardware because there's actually a logo on it and who gets contacted for support. Um, you know, I make kits and other people manufacture them. I just want to make sure that their customers don't come to me with the assumption that um, I manufacture that, and therefore, if there's a problem, I have to replace it. So that's just a also very minor difference. This doesn't really come up with software so much. Um, and so um, most of the time when people talk about open source hardware, there's only like a few things that are involved. It's uh, commercial use allowed. You could sell it. Um, attribution, just credit me. And then uh, share alike. If you make changes, put it out there. And I've been, I guess, assigned to kind of catalog what open source hardware has been over the last five years, six years now, it's been a long time. Um, so in fi 2005, if you look on the far end of this chart, there's only a few projects, and Lamore had like both of them. And then uh, as each year went by, more and more people started doing open source hardware. So we're up to like maybe 300 projects. Um, a lot of them are, are Arduino derivatives, so that's kind of been a big chunk of it in the last year or so. But as you can see, it's, it's, it's going pretty well. And um, 
one of the questions we always get asked, and this is why it's good to do it at a conference, well, who's actually doing open source hardware? What are the types of companies and what are they actually making? Because um, one of the kind of tests if something's a good idea is like, well, you know, no one's ever going to make a million dollars. Well, I emailed all the companies who do open source hardware. Turns out most of them or all of them are making over a million dollars a year in revenue, and a few of them are making over $10 million in revenue, and some of them, uh, most of them are in the middle. Um, if you see, that's, that's, a, that's a chunky middle. And uh, real quick, um, here's some of the companies. Um, Adafruit Industries, um, that's Lamar's company and the company that I, I spend some of my time uh, working with. And uh, we do educational electronics, and um, we also have weird stuff like culture jamming projects, um, stuff that we don't sell, like the cell phone jammer uh, uh, that you can build. Just search for cell phone jammer kit or surf, uh, cell phone jammer but wave bubble on Google, and you'll see the tutorial that Lamar made. And we made a flashlight that's so bright it makes you vomit. That's fun. Maybe we'll show it. Yeah. Um, Homeland Security paid a couple million for one, and uh, we made one for about $250. So uh, we'll get into that in our documentation section. Um, and we're over the million dollar mark now. Um, Arduino, how many of you are familiar with the Arduino project? A little clapping? Yeah. All right. So if you're old school, you remember like basic stamp and like doing things with a microcontroller. It was kind of hard, didn't work on all systems. Now Arduino which kind of grew out of the processing world, um, which is an open source way to do visualization and graphics, um, really took off. There's over 150,000 out there, and they're well over a million dollars in revenue. In fact, they're probably closer to like the five to the 10 zone. And uh, everything that you see on an Arduino, you can make yourself, you can manufacture yourself, um, you can send the boards out. The only thing you can't do is call it Arduino because they have the trademark. That's the only thing they ask that you, you don't do. Um, they also prefer if you don't make the boards blue, but that's just a request. Uh, BeagleBoard, this is uh, an effort from Texas Instruments uh, and DigiKey. They teamed up and they did a, an open source board and they want people to use this OMAP chip. Um, kind of a cool project. Uh, different than the Arduino. If you're interested in making like a portable laptop or a kiosk, this is the, the, the board for you. And over a million dollars in revenue. Um, some of you probably already have these. Bug Labs are based out of here in New York. Uh, they make Lego computers, essentially is the best way to describe it. You, let's say if you wanted to make a GPS, uh, camera, Wi-Fi connected thing, um, you could plug in these modules. It's all Linux based. It uses a Clips. And uh, there you go, uh, rapid prototyping. Uh, they're approaching a million this year. Uh, Chumbi, uh, there are these little kind of ambient devices that you can put anywhere. It's a little screen and uh, it connects online and it downloads a bunch of stuff that you set up in advance. It's kind of like a physical version of uh, widgets on computers. And uh, they're VC funded. Uh, some open source hardware companies don't, aren't just scrappy, like you know, starting this in their basements or their apartments uh, like we have. Uh, they actually went out and got uh, venture capital. And that's an interesting thing because venture capital, they want to buy something that they sell. So what does that mean for open source hardware? And we could talk about that in a bit. But uh, Chumbi does some cool licensing. They also have a Chumbi patent. And uh, Bunny, uh, who's kind of a well-known hacker if you're into the hardware hacking scene, is working on a, a Chumbi hacker board. So it's kind of like um, an Arduino plus the Beagle board, but it's, uh, but it, it's, it, it's really powerful. And uh, we'll have that soon. It's a really neat kind of uh, portable Linux computer for you know, like 100 bucks. Yeah. Yeah, and that'll be neat. Uh, dangerous prototypes, they're a, a, a new entry. Um, Ian, the, the, the maker of this, uh, was a writer at Hackaday and then decided to do a bus pirate. Basically, it's like a reverse engineering tool if you wanted to figure out what's going on over USB or kind of hack something. And, uh, you know, it's like, a, like a digital microscope. So. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good analogy. Um, already almost a million dollars in uh, 2010. DIY drones, um, these are micro-sized uh, civil UAVs. So if you wanted to make your own drone that flies around and take photos, uh, this is a project for you. And one of the cool things is the editor-in-chief of Wired, uh, Chris Anderson, this is his project, and he runs around the world and, um, of course, has to talk about Wired, but this is, it seems to me, this is what his passion is, and he started Geek Dad. And already, this is a hobby that turned into uh, a really big enterprise. Um, you know, drones are fun. Uh, one of the first things that happened is he accidentally flew it into Los Alamos and, like, you know, Oh shit, <laughs> you know, we're under attack, but it was, he's the editor in chief of Wired, so like, if it was one of us, it'd probably be a different story. But he's like, no, no, it's totally okay. Like, I'm just, you know, doing open source hardware, really. Um, Evil Mad Scientist Laboratories, they do uh, really cool clocks, really interesting LED panels. Again, uh, just a couple that does this out of their house, uh, purchasing a million dollars. MakerBot Industries, a lot of uh, folks here are probably familiar with it. They're doing low cost 3D printers. Uh, under under $1,000, and they have a cool website called Thingiverse that people upload all these files to. Uh, already over a million dollars in revenue. 
uh, Maker Shed uh, for Make Magazine. Uh, again, you have a, a, a cool thing like Make that's a, a brand. It's, a, it's the uh, magazine that you'd <laughs> rather be reading than, or building uh, than doing work stuff. But uh, they also, they're also have a store, and there's also a store at Maker Shed. So it's kind of like the gift shop at the end. Uh, Parallax, uh, for those who've been doing electronics for a long time, they've embraced open source hardware, and we've been working with them for them to uh, label it open source hardware and actually kind of get the credit they deserve. They've always published a lot of stuff, but they didn't call it open source hardware, and uh, they're working on that now. Seed Studios, these guys are based out of China, which is kind of neat for them because they're, on, they're closer to the supply chain, and we could talk about cloning and, and uh, kind of uh, the, thing, the challenges of open source hardware because always people say, uh, well, what if your stuff gets cloned in China? Well, it already happens. Um, Seed Studio develops their own stuff, and they do open source hardware, already over a million dollars in revenue. Solar Robotics, they do little robotic kits for kids mostly, but they also do open source hardware, Arduino del derivatives. And SparkFun Electronics, they're kind of leading the, uh, the, the pack right now with revenue, over $10 million in revenue, uh, based out of Boulder, Colorado. A lot of you who do electronics probably get those red boxes in the mail from them. And so that's just a few companies, and this is just, you know, one's in the beginning of a talk just to show just some idea of what's going on. So that's about $50 million worth of companies right, right there. Um, this is with about 200 projects altogether, and most of the companies, as I said before, are already approaching the $5 million mark. And uh, so that's an overview of how all these, uh, what all these folks do. And then what we wanted to do is kind of dig in, um, which is why you're here, is how we actually run an open source hardware business. Um, and we'll... Uh, bounce back and forth between the two of us. Um, we're built on open source software. So uh, one of the questions we always get asked is, well, what are you, what are you running? And uh, Lamore is the one who developed this. So uh, why did you choose um, open source suite instead of like just, you know, a commercial package? Well, it's kind of, well, I, I you know, I, I grew up like hacking Linux. So this was actually something I was pretty comfortable with. And, um, you know, getting a server and running it myself was really an expensive way to start because you can get, um, you know, a, a virtual host for like, you know, 20 bucks a month. Um, and then the web card itself, um, you know, I started with just PayPal buttons and like a simple HTML page, but then eventually it gets more complicated. You need shipping abroad and you need reports and you need invoices and people want to buy more than one thing at once and sales tax and it gets very complicated. And one of the really nice things about having like a LAMP system, especially with something like OS Commerce, which is the core shopping cart, is um, a lot of like the really annoying bullshit of a shopping cart has been taken care of for you. So I can go in and like, I've heavily modified the cart because it's, it's just PHP in my SQL. So, um, you know, we, for example, we added um, like a carrot mod. So if people order more than $100 worth of stuff, you know, they get a free badge or some stickers or something, something extra. And um, most, you know, commercial carts that you would purchase um, like online or, or rent online, um, you know, if they don't have a mod, you're never going to get it. So you can't do all of the, you know, the creative stuff that you may want to do with um, your shopping cart. And being able to differentiate yourself from others is really important. So that's why I suggest open source software. Yeah, and we'll show some of the examples of some of the mods that we did. And, and hopefully, um, we're almost at a good, not, you never finish um, a, uh, a shopping cart. You're always adding things, but uh, we'll be releasing our own mods and packs to the Zencart community. Um, and the, the other question we get, well, what hosting provider do you use? Because your site is on Slashdot sometimes. You never go down. And we use uh, Servant, and we were on the $80 plan uh, for the longest time, and then we just moved to, We like, eventually, we moved up to dedicated because yeah. it, was, it was actually getting out of control. But for a really long time, I was actually on the least expensive, which is like $50. Um, you can get it cheaper from like one and one. But um, what I really like about Servant, I mean, whatever, you, there's other really good ones, but um, I moved from many hosting providers and like, they actually like tell you before they go down for like two days and like, you know, they actually do yeah. backups and like I've actually asked them to, get, you know, like I overwrote my like HT access file and I'm like, I'm never writing those mod rewrites again. I have to get that file back. And they actually got it back for me. And that's, that's really impressive. And like being able to undelete like one file, if that saves you, a couple hours that's worth a hundred bucks of your time because it's, it's, it's such a hassle and if if they go down you know you lose those days sales so even though a lot of people I think want to go with five dollar hosting I think it's it's the one thing that if you're gonna spend money on get a good hosting provider either servant or some other place that you know won't screw you over and then like not answer your phone calls yeah I mean if you're living um, if you make your living from an online store it's it is the most important thing you know in our studio we have two internet connections because 
like we figured out like when our internet connection goes down we're kind of screwed we don't even get a third because during the holidays and, and when it's mission critical we really need to do stuff so from hosting provider point of view and even in our own yeah. um, our own, our own studio. So our shopping cart software, as Lamore said, uh, we use Zencart, and uh, which is a, it's a fork of OS Commerce. Yeah, so and there's a couple forks of OS Commerce. So you can choose which one you want. There's like three or four. I like Zencart, but a lot of people use OS Commerce. Yeah. They're pretty easy. I mean, they're not easy to modify, but if you've had any experience with, again, like MySQL or, or PHP, uh, it's not too bad. Yeah. And then this is just a behind the scenes look. Um, and we'll have all these slides online. And uh, we also have uh, an article that we wrote about this. But this is what it looks like behind the scenes. The orders come in. Uh, a, a customer places it. It says processing. Um, we have pending orders for pe people who uh, use a purchase order or if they send a check or money order that just waits until we approve it. And um, from there, we've done some cool mods. One of the neat things that we did recently was uh, when our um, staff comes in, they can press one button that prints all orders that aren't expedited. And then we have another button that prints all expedited orders. When someone orders something uh, overnight, no matter what you say, if you say, well, we, you know, we don't ship every day. We ship, it takes two to three days or whatever. It doesn't matter. If someone orders something overnight, they actually think you're going to stop everything and send it overnight. So we do that. We, pri we prioritize the orders that have expedited shipping. And that's solved a lot of customer support issues because people will call us at three in the morning and say, you know, I ordered a Arduino and I really needed it by today. Like, where is it? And it is, sometimes they say it's life or death. I'm not quite sure what they're doing with an Arduino, but um, <laughs> they say, no, you don't understand it's life or death. Um, and so because we use Zencart and because we use LAMP and because we have uh, all this data, uh, we developed an inventory system, a predictive inventory system. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, so um, one of the things that um, you'll, it, it doesn't really come up, but is really important is like supply chain engineering, which is basically how Walmart makes so much money, is that you have to have just enough stuff that you'll be able to sell it, but not so much that you're sitting on piles of inventory. And the balance between the two is really, really hard. Um, so one of the things that I did to help me, and you can keep it all in your head sometimes, but um, you know, if you, again, if you have an open source cart where you can touch the database and grab data out, it's very easy to say, well, how many of like X did I sell in the last two weeks and do I have that many left? If I don't, and I know it takes me two weeks to get, send me an email and warn me. And um, this is actually something that, you know, you know, MBAs, you know, contract out for $100,000, but it's, it's really simple to do if you know even the most basic database programming. So this is like a report uh, system and you can see, you know, when the red marks mean you're not going to make it to the, you know, the next week or two weeks. So be sure to you know, get that stuff in stock as quickly as possible. And also, you know, I can just look down and see, like, am I okay for the next two weeks? Are there any red marks? Or when I want to order something, I want to keep, say, one quarter's worth of inventory in stock. I look on the very right-hand side, and there's a number and says, okay, you know, you need to get 1,000 breadboard wires because you send, you know, sell 1,000 bundles uh, per quarter. Uh, it makes purchasing much easier. And that's another thing that's going to take up more and more time is just keeping track of inventory and purchasing and when to get and what and yeah psychologically we kind of view this as a video game we don't have a tv or play video games or play Var farmville or whatever but it's kind of like that we're we're like you know oh crap you know we need to plant more of these things because the trees need to come up because we have to feed the sheep you know it's it is it is a lot like that maybe that's why we think it's fun because we're kind of playing this game and, and instead of getting coins you actually get real money so that's fun um the other thing that uh yeah <laughs> The other thing that uh, Lamore worked on was the parts selector. So we get asked all the time, where do you get your stuff? Uh, where do you get your shipping supplies? Where do you get everything? So instead of answering everybody, we just made a wiki. Um, it's kind of like a defense mechanism. It's like, stop talking, here's a wiki. And uh, we put all this stuff up there. And so that's another thing. Once the inventory system says, oh shit, you need switches fast, because too many people ordered the blinking wheels. Um, we can go into our own part selector that we use as a resource, and then we also released it for everybody else. It's, it's actually not very, it, it, it's so obvious that it, it um, you know, took me forever to get done, but once I did it, it saved me so much time. It's actually just a list of every component I get, all the parts that, you know, make up the kits, um, and then a link to, you know, to the precise page where to buy it. And then um, if I have multiple suppliers, that's something that's really important is to have at least two or three suppliers for every item you need because um, one will go on vacation or like, you know, go out of business or something and you need to have yeah. a backup um, or they'll be out of stock and it's like four to six weeks. And so, you know, I can quickly go through all of my suppliers or even, you know, have an employee do it and say like, okay, we need to get, you know, um, like packing materials, get like 500 boxes and then they just click the link and, and order it. And, it's, it's, and all these little things which seem like really 
small details, they, they add up together and allow you to get so much more done. And again, it's like all of this stuff is like if you can edit a wiki or if you can edit a spreadsheet, um, instead of keeping it all on little pieces of paper stuck to your desk, which is what a lot of purchasing managers do, um, yeah. this will really help you out. And also, you know, this is also a public resource. Other people use this for when they want to find out where's the cheapest place to get a microcontroller. Um, I did the research for them and they can just click on that link. Yeah. I mean, the downside is our competitors use this, but like, whatever. Like, you know, they're going to, they're going to buy something from us anyways and then figure out where we got it from and do this. So like, you know, why don't we just save them some time? They can compete with us on other things. Um, next up. This is what one of our invoices look like. Uh, when the customer places an order, goes into Zencart, we assign a barcode to it and we'll show you our actual like off the shelf stuff that we bought off eBay. And uh, one of the things that we do, that little green box, over time we it's, figured- It's now red. Yeah, it's now red. <laughs> one of the it's things green. that we figured out is there's certain things that humans are really good at and certain things that computers are good at. So what we do is we look at the address, we look at how it matches up, we look, there's certain countries, there's certain things. We almost have like a no fly list um, with some filters. And it's basically, oh, uh, shipping person, please stop and take a look at this. If someone's ordering something overnight and their uh, uh, billing address is in Uzbekistan, but they wanted to go to LA to a hotel, um, and it's like $1,000 worth of Arduinos, we should probably ask some questions. And it turns out every single time it's been true. Well, it's interesting because um, fraud prevention, like credit card fraud prevention, computers are really, really bad at it. So if anyone out there wants to start a company, make a lot of money, this is actually a really good idea because credit card, like Authorize and other credit card companies have a fraud detection suite and it's crap. It's like the worst thing ever. It doesn't do a good job at all. And even PayPal's yeah. isn't that great. But humans are really good at it. Um, and I don't completely know why, but like we can quickly look at addresses and say like, oh, this person is just shipping it to their work address. I can tell because like it's, you know, it's close. It's the zip code is really close. Um, and, you know, obviously this is a business address. It's like, you know, Circle Drive or something or, yeah. or you know. Um, well, people use names like FUBAR. Like, come on, like, come on, credit card thief guy. Like, come on, try a little harder. Sometimes they use celebrity names. I'm like, no, you're not Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt does not want Arduinos. So, um, or like, or like Hotmail address. Like, it's like little yeah. things. Like, there, there's little things like what kind of email address. Yeah. If it's a name at gmail.com, it's actually less likely to be fraud than like, you know, spritzy49 sparkle at like hotmail.com. Yeah. That like sets off alarms for people, but yeah. computers don't know that a hotmail address is less um, reliable yeah. than a university address. Not everybody who uses PayPal is a credit card thief, but every credit card thief we've had uses uh, uh, hotmail. Odd. Um, and he, here's a, uh, I'll go back one more. Here's another kind of fun, because um, you guys are all security freaks. Um, so someone was using our shopping cart to test if credit cards were stolen. So what they would do is buy these uh, list of credit cards, enter it into our cart with fake names just to see if they could get the authorization. Like it would say like, sorry, your address doesn't match and our cart wouldn't pass it through. But then once in a while we get people calling up and say, hey, I saw a charge from Adafruit that came and then one way, what happened? And I'm like, oh, okay, so what we did is we actually set up our shopping cart. If people attempt to use credit cards from the same IP address more than a couple times, it text messages my phone, I go online, and then I have an automatic script that goes to see where their IP address is from. And most of the time, it's like little villages in China or India, and then we ban that. So it took just one week, and we just started to ban. But I've never heard of a single shopping cart that has that built in. Yeah. Even though it's like such an obvious thing you'd want to defend against. So and if you have a commercial cart, it, you know, you get, you still have to pay um, a fee every time somebody declines a card. Like, you still have to pay that decline fee. Um, yeah. It's like 20 cents, but like, if they're doing 100 cards, it can add up. But, you know, it took us like half an hour, you know, a simple little like check how many, you know, failures has, has this person had and sending an yeah. email via PHP. We just, we we're just annoyed. We didn't want someone to use our, our cart for that. You know, go use someone else's who doesn't care about the stuff. Um, Amazon or something. Um, and then the other thing that we did was um, because we have a, a shopping cart system that we can completely modify, one of the things that started to take up all of our time was resellers. If you're selling electronics um, and you're doing a good job, other people want to sell the stuff for you. And that's really good. And we'll talk about margins in just a few minutes. But uh, we decided, well, you know, there's resellers and people have businesses. But there's also a lot of hacker spaces. In fact, later on today, there's a great talk from, I think, Mitch and some other people who talk about hacker spaces. We decided, you know, we should make hacker spaces resellers. So what we did is we made a special uh, 
flag on an account. And when, when someone says they're a hackerspace and tell us that they have like 50 people, they want to sell kits, we make them a reseller. And when they log in, um, they get a different little banner. So it says wholesale club up at the top. If you look at the bottom, it says, oh, your price is now as low as $51 instead of $85. So as they're shopping, they can actually see the discounts that they're going to get. It's the same shopping cart. It's just a different level of uh, discounts applied. And so instead of people faxing stuff, um, on the education side, or companies having to fax stuff to purchasing lady named Ethel, you know, she could just go and put it into the shopping cart, and then they check out, and it saves us probably two or three staff positions just to have a shopping cart that can do resellers. Um, some other cart systems online that use OS Commerce and ZenCart, um, SparkFun, they've really tweaked theirs out, um, and they use OS Commerce. Uh, Seed Studio, one of the other companies I mentioned before, uh, they use OS Commerce. Uh, Zen, no, I'm sorry, they Zencart. use Zencart. Yeah. They use Zencart. And uh, that kind of moves us along to payments. Well, uh, taking money is probably the most important thing. So for a card processor, you, we use authorize.net. And one of the things that, um, there's probably some security folks. How many here have heard of PCI compliance? Yeah, wow, you guys are like. Wow, okay. <laughs> you are the, <laughs> we are at a credit card uh, <laughs> convention. Yeah. Um, so PCI compliance is neat. If you store credit cards, if you have the customer data, um, you have to follow all these things. So what we do is we do an authorization, and authorize is owned by Visa. It's about, yeah, it's yeah. about to or just or got about purchased or, or something. And they come up with the PCI compliance standards, of course. Um, they're all connected. And uh, what we do is we use authorize to authorize the charges, and we don't store any credit cards. Now, there's a few good things. No one can kind of hack us just for this credit card information. This hasn't happened to, to us. There's always a, a method of attack. But we don't have credit cards on our servers anywhere. And so we don't have to worry about this as much. It's an authorized problem. There is, they do an authorization. They tell us how much money we can charge. We can't charge over that amount. And that's pretty much what we decided to do. It's worked out so far. Yeah, I mean, like, there, you know, there's a couple of downsides. Like, you know, you, you can't have back orders and then ship the back order later. And, like, you can't, you can't do one click. You yeah, can't, so. you know, like, yeah, do one click. And, you know, be, you, people have to enter in the credit card data every time. But we found that, you know, if we tell pe customers who complain about that, we say, look, um, it's, you know, for your safety, we don't even want to touch this data and have it in our database because we don't want that risk. You know, we think that we've secured our, our server pretty well, but, you know, why, why have this stuff hanging around? Why have this for the taking? And so far we've had almost, you know, no problems. And it's not yeah. like, I don't think that our sales have hurt at all. So if you're setting up a store, I strongly uh, encourage people not to store credit card data, even though it's tempting and, you know, for, you know, chargeback verification or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's not worth it, even if you would make a little bit more money because of the extra hassles, time of, of PCI compliance, which is now um, required of everyone. Yeah, and just as far, kind of on a side note, we never allow people to pay us money if we're not able to ship something uh, immediately, for the most part. And we, we learned this lesson a few times. If uh, someone orders something and we don't have it in stock, even if it takes a few days, um, we decided not to allow that recently. Um, for some items we will, but most we won't, because once you have someone's money, the first thing is like, I paid you and you didn't send me my thing. And so we've decided that we're not going to do that, and that's solved a lot of customer support issues. Um, if there's products that we have that are really popular, some people are like, well, can't I just pay now and you send it whenever? It's tempting. No, we don't do that. The number one lesson of business, I'd say, is do not take people's money unless you have something to ship them within like two days. Yeah. And even credit card companies will punish you if you don't capture an authorization within like one or two days. You have to pay a little more. Yeah. And even though it's tempting to say, oh, ships to 46 weeks, I need that money to help me fund the you know, manufacturer, just don't do it because I've actually never seen anyone who didn't say afterwards, I completely regret doing that. I was greedy and I wanted that money quickly, yeah. but um, I spent all my time dealing with pissed off customers. Yeah. Some people are like, oh, I'll just take $5 just to prove that they want it. It's a nightmare. Um, so next up, we also take PayPal. And uh, that's how... Uh, more started with Adafruit, there's just a buy button on a page. PayPal makes it really easy. International customers, um, they can use PayPal a lot easier. A lot of them want to do bank transfers, and that's always, uh, there's fees and everything. Um, we suggest when you start out, um, if you just have a web page with a button, PayPal is the way to go. And then a pro tip, um, when you get a PayPal account, get one of these, they have a little e-ink card, and then they have a little dongle. You have to put in your password, and then you also have to use this dongle. It's just, it's another layer of security. Um, it's probably harder to, to, to crack all this than just getting someone's PayPal password. And when we see um, theft and fraud from PayPal, it's usually when a customer, they get their password stolen. And we had a customer who said, oh, I, li I live in this apartment building, and someone w got on my Wi-Fi and figured out my login and password. And uh, this has happened a bunch of times. I'm like, where do you live? Like, do they, can't, you know, 
really? Like everyone around you is they're doing this constantly? Like maybe figure out another another place to live. But that was their biggest problem is someone kept someone kept getting their PayPal password and buying stuff and they'd have it shipped to the same place because they all live in the same place. I'm like, don't you ever run into someone with your package? No. Anyways. So get one of those. I think it's like a couple bucks. Um, and then um, as far as kind of this falls on the marketing side, we don't do marketing, um, but uh, we did decide to try to make the best electronics blog, whatever you want to call it now, online. And in order to do that, we wanted to have a really good system. And so we embedded WordPress directly inside our site. And that worked out really well. So anytime you're looking at cool electronic projects online from us, even if it's not something we sell, you're, surround, you're in the, 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 the chrome of the store and you're able to see um, products that we sell. And we've seen sales increase because of this. We also did this with our forum. So everything is inside the store. And we, we like that a lot. And WordPress, um, it's a little tricky, but, it was, but we hacked keep, on just it. Just keep it updated and don't store yeah. credit cards. And <laughs> yeah. And uh, we do things like customers send us uh, emails. Um, hey, I, got, I ordered something today, and you guys shipped it um, in 20 minutes, and it's 2,000 miles away, and I got my Arduino, and I saved my grandfather's life because his Arduino is, is his pacemaker or something like that. Huh? And uh, so we put those up online. You know, we have customer feedback that goes directly on our blog. Um, one of the things that uh, we suggest, though, if you're going to have a content destination, if you're going to do documentation, if you're going to have something for people to return to every day, um, measure it. I mean, we didn't really set out to have um, any specific goals with traffic, but uh, starting the, the Adafruit blog, it already went up to a million page views in a month, and that does equate to sales. Um, same thing with Make. Um, zero to five or six million page views in less than a year when we started a few years back. And um, if you're not measuring something, there's really no way to improve, I think. So uh, there's free tools. You can use any of them. We use Google Analytics, um, whatever. Uh, there's probably other ones or, or, or other companies. They make good graphs, and they can tell you where people are coming from. I like it. Uh, the other thing we do is we have forums. So if you have a product and you need to support it, you can do it over email. But all that knowledge is lost. It's going from email to email. Maybe if they're on Gmail, Gmail makes some money because they'll put some ads around it. But that knowledge that you're transferring to that person is, is gone. So um, although it would be nice to answer every email individually, what we do is we have the customers post up in the forums. And recently we added a mod that when you start an account on Adafruit to order something, you automatically have an account in the Adafruit forums. And that's worked out really well. And we do have moderation. We hired someone to go and make sure that there's no spam, first off. And uh, we did a mod to PHPBB, which is kind of neat. We have a little skull just for the administrators. So when someone does spam or does something wrong, we have a skull and you press it, it bans their username, their IP address, their email address, and then it says, I destroyed them. So we kind of, <laughs> we try to make moderating fun for our moderators because it is neat to get a spammer and it is kind of fun that you know that they're never going to visit the site. And once in a while there's collateral damage. We'll get someone from Indonesia or something like that. It's like, I can't, I can't post on the forums. It says I'm a spammer. And it's like, okay, well, um, last week your IP address someone was. And they're like, oh yeah, uh, oops, you know. So they, you know, they're like, oh yeah, my company does that once in a while. So, um, but I want help with my Arduino. Um, so uh, PHPBB is what we use. There's other open source forum software but it's the one that we like the most yeah. right now. Uh, documentation, we're going to spend a lot of time on this because we think this is the most important thing. This is kind of our advertisement. We think if you put out good information, that is your advertising. Um, we have, we think, some of the best tutorials online, maybe about 100? Like over 100. Over 100 right now. And uh, there's no ads on them. There's, uh, you don't need to buy the electronics from us necessarily. And we show you, we, we teach people, and we think if you teach people, they'll, they'll reward you. So if you go to our tutorial section, you can see them. But that's what we spend a lot of time on. In fact, you spend more time on documentation than designing electronics. Yeah, the, the engineering takes a couple of days. The documentation takes weeks. And then once you're doing the documentation, you realize you made a mistake, and then you have to do some more engineering, and then yeah. it's a cycle. And uh, one of the other things we do is once we think a tutorial is done, finished, complete, we put it in other places, like Instructables, because they have just a massive amount of people that are looking at their, uh, their pages. And so we'll just basically copy and paste our documentation directly into Instructables. And that's another great thing you can do. If you do documentation once, it can go different places. You can turn it into an article. You can turn it into, if it's a helpful how-to, if it's not just like spammy about your, your product, um, you can actually do more with it. And so I don't know if it's because you get, it's not laziness. It's just like if I do something once, I want to be able to do it in multiple places. Speaking of, um, if you get a digital camera, one of the things to look into is a wireless card for it. So when we take a photo in our studio 
of a product for documentation. It uploads to Flickr. It tweets to all of our Twitter followers. It goes onto our blog now, and it goes into our documentation system. So that's one click, one photo, um, and it's out. And that's uh, kind of a, a, a fun thing. We get customer feedback immediately. Um, we're kind of over of keeping, we're not, we're not, we don't keep stuff in secret anymore. If we're working on something, we put photos out there. That builds demand. People like it. And it's been working out. Um, the iFi manager is something that you can configure to go just about anywhere, including your own site. It doesn't have to be Flickr or whatever. And uh, it goes to our photo stream, like I said. And we also have a Flickr photo group that customers put their stuff in. And so they'll build something, and then they'll put it in the Flickr photo pool to show other people. And then kind of making begets making. And uh, already we have a few thousand people. They're putting all their projects in with the kits we have, and they're sharing that with all their friends. Again, this is kind of like good information is, is advertising for us. Uh, and every time we do something, we try to make sure it goes everywhere. So uh, we don't really like Facebook or Twitter that much, but they are kind of useful for some folks. And so we make sure that when we put a blog post online, it goes to our Facebook group page, it goes to Twitter, it goes to all these different places. Um, but we only do it once. We don't actually spend our time on this. There's tons of free web services that people got venture capital for that'll eventually die that we should totally take advantage of. Um, uploading videos is subsidized by all these companies. They just want your content. Um, none, of it's, none of the content's that great, but they can host your awesome HD product videos because they just, they're dying for good stuff. Uh, so that's us, that's us on Twitter. Um, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, and speaking of, uh, we'll go back one. Uh, oh, no, we'll save the video just for a couple oh, more slides. Okay. Um, we also had a product that uh, went on Twitter. So we had this uh, kilowatt device that keeps track of how much power usage you have in your home. And we decided to turn it into a tweeting power meter. And so we uh, entered in design competition. We won, and we said, well, this could be a pretty cool kit. So every time, um, usually every 24 hours or so, um, our Twitter followers of this Tweetawatt know how much power we've used. And people who want to do power grid analysis, um, Google announced a product that they're not really doing much with called Get Google Power Meter. We use a Google App Engine, which is kind of neat. Um, but uh, we turned a product into, uh, or a, an idea into a product. And so now you can see how much power that we, how, power we use. And people follow it. They just want to know how much power the Adafruit Studio uses. And they're like, oh, you know, I'd, I'd like to buy one of those and hook up my, uh, my apartment. And then we have our videos. Um, we got a new pick and place machine, really cool machine that places little tiny microscope parts. And that's around the same time that we decided to do a video show called Ask an Engineer. Um, we do a weekly video show. It's, we're going to do it tonight. Um, we don't know if we're going to do it here at our studio. And uh, it's an hour of asking engineering questions to more. Because uh, asking engineering questions in person is pretty hard, but people can spend a little bit of time, ask very specific questions, and we can use a whiteboard and, and show stuff. And it's been pretty successful. So every week we have up to 1,000 people who ask questions. And uh, we have someone who records it in California. They upload it for us, kind of like what's going on with this, the videos here at Hope. Um, that's really useful. If you were to try to do that yourself, it's actually pretty hard. And it takes a lot of time to move videos around online. So we started doing that in addition to all the other videos we do. And as far as the medium goes, it used to be like having lots of photos helpful. Now we actually think videos are helpful. And um, like I said, it, you don't necessarily need to do videos about your product. Um, we, one of our more popular videos right now, and we're going to just take a quick video break so you can see it, is um, a project we did. And we put this video up. And you can't buy anything that you see here, but it was one of our biggest days in sales. So I'll hop over to this video real quick. And I'm going to share with you some information about my latest project. But before I get into the technical details, I'd like you to watch this video. It's from a conference I attended two years ago. And uh, I'm from Washington, and I'm here to help. You probably saw on YouTube, uh, there's a video going around, and it says, Don't tase me, bro. Well, uh, non-lethal weapons uh, are uh, really pretty critically uh, important. And so what I have with me is a Dazzler. So the Dazzler is a seasickness machine. And what it does, it uses LEDs, and it's a random generator, and it affects your equilibrium. I'm not going to point it at you. I was with a group of GE executives yesterday, and I held it up like this, and just the reflection made them nauseous. We're trying to change from don't tase me, bro, to daz me, bro. <laughs> 
And that's it. Oi. Let me know when you're feeling Oi, bad. Yeah. Thank you. Anyway, thank you so much. So we decided to look online to find out more information, and we ended up finding some news stories. And tonight, Homeland Security has spent close to a million dollars on a flashlight that can stop you in your tracks. Even law enforcement says it is going to be controversial. We wanted to see just how effective the light is. Okay, that's a lot brighter. Those blotches in my vision stayed with me for about a half hour after the test. And then a strong headache kicked in. It's still a little blinding. Like most government projects, the Dazzler was actually invented and developed by an outside consulting firm. So we looked up some information about this firm, uh, found the patent, and looked up exactly what it is that they did. The portable flashlight flashes green LEDs at about 10 hertz. This causes flash blindness, startling, disorientation, vertigo, and occasional vomiting. We thought we could probably do that for under a million dollars, so we put together this project for about 250 bucks and are publishing all the information so that you can build one of these at home. Here is the project enclosure. So I reused a flashlight that I got from Sears. Um, so this is the head, which holds the LEDs and electronics inside. This push button is how we activate it. It's uh, not turned on right now. Um, and here is a lead acid battery that provides power. Up here we have 36 LEDs. Each one has a lens that focuses the optics. So I'm going to remove just the lens and you can see that there's a basic heat sink with a fan on the back to help with a little um, heat sinking. Here we have the circuit board. We have six driver FETs, two for each color, red, green, and blue. We have a Arduino clone here which I use to basically do the pulse width modulation, the randomization, and mode selection. And there's a wire that travels down the body to the battery. Then behind here, you can remove this plate. There's a 9-volt battery that powers just the Arduino. It's a separate power supply to avoid uh, noise that comes from the pulse width modulation. Uh, reprogramming header for upda updating the firmware and a mode button which lets me uh, change what kind of display it is. Want to make one yourself? Well, we've got the schematics, source code, and circuit board layouts all available online at ladyada.net slash make slash bedazzler. You may be wondering, does it really work? Bedazzler human subject test. Ready in three, two, one. The goggles, they do nothing. Well, turns out it doesn't work that well, but it is great for raves. Okay, so that day a lot of people bought Arduinos. But uh, we actually sold nothing, none of that stuff that we have, other than like the Arduino chip itself, um, is for sale at our store. This was just a project that we wanted to do because we really hate the Department of Homeland Security. But Well, actually, no, it was just that guy. He was it was so, actually just that guy. He was such an asshole. He was so creepy. But, um, but the video went everywhere. People went to Lady.net, found the instructions, were like, this is really cool. And then, you know, they started looking around the site, and then they, you know, they were like, TV be gone. Well, I want one of those. And then before you know it, you know, we had a record sales day, even though there was nothing in that video for us to sell. Yeah. Okay. Um, Let's wrap up. Yeah. We have just a few more slides, and we're going to take some questions. So we do this live show. We do those videos. Um, we kind of, we do track everything you saw. You know, we try, try to measure this stuff. Um, our uh, wiki has a lot of this information. Um, one of the things that we did is when we buy weird new equipment that has uh, a bunch of people who don't like sharing information, um, we put all the information up online. So we bought this pick and place machine. It's this $30,000 machine that makes little, puts little tiny parts. Um, we could make an iPhone in our um, apartment now if we really wanted to. Um, but none, nobody used to share this information. So now in our forums, in our wiki, we have the best information about this. Now everyone goes to our forums first because they search online because Google loves good information. And they come to our forums and they're like, I'm thinking about buying this machine and I, I want to know what you guys think. So all these old timers who have these machines are, are kind of coming out of their, their shell early. And putting up information. They're like, well, just watch out for this and watch out for this part. So we were able to do that. Uh, we have a, a laser cutter 
that we got a few years ago, and we put up all the information about how to use the laser cutter, and then people started businesses. Recently, a company sold for $10 million, and all they did was follow our wiki on how to, what laser to buy, the templates for laser etching, gadgets, MacBooks, and iPhones, and all that, and they sold it to another company, which is kind of neat. Um, our other kind of uh, basic tools that we use, um, a lot of it you're probably familiar with. So we use Gmail for a lot of stuff, because we have multiple people answering some customer support issues. Uh, that are order related, so more than one person can, can do it. Um, we use the Google Merchant Center. Um, you just need to make sure, and this is something supported in Zencart, that your products are in an XML file and you can upload it and people find it easier through, through Google. Um, we use Google Voice because it transcribes voicemail and that's a lot better than um, listening to voicemail. You can just look at the words real quick. Uh, for shipping, we use the United States Postal Service for half our orders, and the other half is UPS. We used to use FedEx, but UPS has a better API, so we're able to do things uh, quicker and easier. We use Indicia for our postage that prints out automatically, um, and it weighs it on our scale that we got off eBay. And uh, for postal, we have a daily pickup that you can set up in a web form, and for UPS, we have a daily pickup, and that saves a lot of time. If you do international sales, you'll be stuck at the post office. Try not to do that. Um, this is what we use. We have a shuttle computer, a scale, a barcode reader, and a label maker. And this is all, of course, on our site. And those things are all commodity off-the-shelf stuff. And it costs like maybe $1,000 at the most. Um, we did a, a talk somewhere. And Pitney Bowes, who makes those big mail machines, kind of freaked out. And they asked, could they come to our place? And it was just like no smiles all around. Like our little $1,000 system blows the $100,000 like giant mail things. And they're like, shit, you know, what are we going to do? <laughs> This is the future, you know, and, and we're like, yeah, we put it all online and anyone can build it just like us. And they're like, uh. And, it, and it's basically all, again, it's commodity hardware, the scale, talks, serial, the um, USB barcode reader um, spits out HID that Python can very easily parse. Um, the printer, you know, there's some Python libraries out there as well. And then, you know, you, you scan the invoice, it weighs it, you know, talks to the UPS or USPS API and prints out the label. So basically, you can ship in like five seconds, you know, the exact amount uh, yeah. necessary. So usually, if you go to Pitney Bowes, like they don't actually, they just say like call for a quote, but it's like uh, 10 or to $20,000 per station. Whereas for us to duplicate this station, if we need like two shipping stations for the holidays, it's like another $500 right, yeah. of, of eBay stuff. And uh, during the holidays, we have a live web camera where people can see a ship orders. And I didn't think it was going to be popular. No, turns out. There's people who just want to watch us ship packages. <laughs> so, and, and they'll place an order and they'll say, hey, can you ship my package? And I'm like, yes, I will. Um, and so this is what it looks like every day. This is just a, um, our little cart. And we fill this up until it gets about this tall. And then the postal or the UPS person shows up. And um, that's how we run our kit business. And um, we're going to spend just one more minute on telling you just some quick bullet points. Again, this is all available. And then we'll, uh, if you want to start lining up for questions while we read this, we still have 10 minutes for questions. Um, these are the 15 things you need to do if you want to start an open source hardware business after you leave this session. So want to okay. really quick? This is very, usually this is itself its own 30-minute presentation. Yeah. Um, so the first step is you just need a skill or an interest or something that you're really good at. Um, if you're not sure what it is, ask your friends and they'll probably tell you. And it probably isn't the thing you wish you were really good at, but it's the thing you're really good at anyways. Um, it, just, it just seems to be true. <clears throat> and then uh, think of a good name for your company. Um, make sure it's easy to spell. I've noticed a lot of people like to like throw a lot of A's and E's in there, and it's very hard to spell something like that. So something that you can say over the phone um, and people will remember, it, it just comes in handy. Uh, once you have thought of a name and you've done like the most basic trademark search and just like you know checking with your city or state, they, they have a database you can look uh, to see if there's any registered companies with that name. Um, then register the domain name and of course get you know all the .nets and any variation of spelling. So it's six dollars a year. You might as well just get them all. Uh, then file a DBA with your city or state. That co costs you about thirty to fifty dollars. Uh, it takes a couple hours. It's very simple. Uh, and then that's your business name. All right, so then now your Adafruit Industries are not just, you know, Lamar and Phil. Uh, next, digital camera. Um, don't use a camera phone. Get an actually pretty good camera. It doesn't have to be like a DSLSR. I used um, like a Canon snap and shoot that was $200, you know, five years ago. And I used that for many, many years, um, and it's fine. A tripod will help a lot in getting some good lights. There's thousands of tutorials on how to do like $50 um, softbox light setups um, on Instructables or on like Lifehacker. Uh, okay, so now you have to have a couple projects that you're going to make, and it's good to have a little bit of variety because you don't know what people are going to end up wanting. So I say like two to four is a good idea. 
uh, and then take all these photos and then find one photo that's like a really iconic photo, um, you know, something that sort of explains everything that it does. And you know, I, don't take a photo of like the parts. Take a photo of it doing the thing it does. Like for example, um, Mitch here who has TV be gone. You know, if you're going to have a photo of a TV be gone, it should be someone turning off a TV. Right? I mean, you might not be able to see the TV gone with their hand, but the action of what they're doing, which is important. Uh, now you put all your documentation online. If it's open source hardware, you can, you know, publish some schematics and CAD files and, and you know, all these photos and everything. And now you have to figure out your pricing. Um, and this is something that um, slips people up because they just say, well, I'll just charge a little bit more than what it costs me. Um, but that's actually, um, you're going to end up ruined because it's never as little as you think it is. There's all these other little things like taxes and fees and, and shipping costs. So, um, you know, some people say, well, I'll just double the parts cost. And even that's not enough because um, if you do that, you're okay, but you'll never be able to expand to having resellers. And unless you're... Ex Unless you're going to, you know, ship internationally for the rest of your life, uh, you won't have distributors. So be sure to add two margins of 40%, so that's 60% markup. Um, get some inventory, put some PayPal buy it now buttons on your website, um, and then, you know, start emailing people that you think might be interested. Like, don't be spammy, but just, you know, blogs and, or um, forums that are interested in this sort of stuff to say, hey, this is really cool, check this out, let me know if you're interested in purchasing it. Um, you know, make a website, uh, you know, you know guys know how to do that, or WordPress or whatever. Um, ha of course, have a way to contact you and maybe even a photo of who you are so it's not like some creepy website. Um, and then just watch your web stats and see what people say on, on these blogs or these forums and how people respond and email you. And, and they'll, they'll find out what it is that they want. They'll email you repetitively saying, sell me this thing, sell me this thing, sell me this thing, and then that's your product so you can start with that. And then uh, you basically just repeat it and try to come out with like two or three things a year and that'll keep interest high so you don't end up stagnating. Yeah, and you'll know when you have success because it feels just like panic. Same, <laughs> sa same emotion. Okay, so we're going to take some questions. Um, we'll go through them as fast as we can. Uh, uh, first thing I'm going to say, Lamore, your uh, documentation is what I consider a high watermark and I've actually held it up a number of times for people saying this is what really good documentation should be. Yay. So Yay. thank you. Um, <laughs> Other question is, like, I'm from Canada, and anytime we order anything from the States, you know, SparkFun, you guys, whatever, shipping is always such a pain in the ass. Um, I know you ship UPS, and, you know, they'll be standing at your front door with your package. It's like, yeah, I want 30 bucks, or else I'm not giving you your yeah, package. Yeah, UPS, UPS and FedEx, they don't even really warn you about that, although yeah. now they have a service where you can pay that up front, but that's why we don't suggest UPS. It's kind of a nightmare, because UPS will get it there in one day, and Postal will take two weeks, but Postal doesn't rip you off. Yeah, but it, just is there a reason that you guys don't offer FedEx? Because typically with FedEx, everything is in the uh, end cost. Uh, You're not standing there in a bathrobe. That's you know, not true, actually. Um, they actually do mail you a letter later, and if you don't pay it, I have to pay it. Ah. So that's why I don't okay. offer FedEx because, like, I sent one pack. You know, I only had to send two packages to Canada. And they have recently, very recently, like the last few months, changed this. But sending packages, someone didn't pay it. I got hit with a couple hundred dollar bill. Um, and so, like, luckily that person was very nice and they did pay it, but um, there's always, talk to FedEx and UPS, they, they, will, they, they want $30 from somebody, um, it's just not clear who. Ah, okay. and you know what, that said, I'm going to take the snippet of video and send it to the Small Business Association in the U.S., because they should know, like, they should see, like, you want to buy stuff, Canada, like, I thought NAFTA solved this. But yeah, free trade, my yeah. ass. But, but we do, work. you know, but, but that's why having distributors is really important, because, you know, if you have a Canadian distributor, they, because it's, it's very cheap to send tons of stuff and there's NAFTA agreements and there's no tariffs. Okay, well thank you. All right, we're going to try to get through these as fast as we can. So there's a lot of uh, intellectual property involved, obviously. How much legal support have you needed? Um, so far, none. Um, but uh, we did have, we run into a problem with um, Velamin. Um, we had an image on our site that says we don't sell blinking Christmas trees. And they sell blinking Christmas trees, and they got one of these like mall lawyers to send us a, like a cease and desist like letter. So we had to contact the EFF, and we it, and then they went away. So like we like they got annoyed because I think we're doing well, but they were upset that we said that we don't sell something of theirs because we think blinking Christmas trees are kind of dumb. So. so do you ever have situations where somebody uh, makes something interesting, but they don't want to set up a store and then come to you and say, hey, can you sell this for us? And do you do that? Yeah. Yeah, fact, all the time. Yeah. In fact, that seems to be our new business model. They're like, I saw your presentation <laughs> about what it's like to run a store. I do not want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, can I just hand you stuff and you send me a check? And I guess we can. 
Um, but we have a pretty high standard. It has to be open source. Um, it has to be, you know, kind of a cool maker. Um, one of the things we learned by talking with Mitch, who has a great talk, don't do business with people you don't like. Like, no matter what the, how much money you think you're going to make, yeah, don't, don't do it. Is that um, you mentioned suppliers, and I was curious, in order to maximize margins and whatnot, do you have any tools to scrape your vendor web, your supplier websites to, or any APIs you guys use? Uh, no, I mean, I, I just do it by hand. I mean, when we do purchasing, sometimes I just check really quickly, but, you know, there's only three suppliers. You just check their price, and then, you know, you do the purchase. Okay. Um, but there's also, like, findships.com. There's a bunch of people who, uh, and Octopart, yeah. there's a bunch of people who kind of do that. They scrape for no, you. No, I, I, do, I do use find chips. I mean, that they definitely help, but there's sometimes yeah. it... It fluctuates depending on like so many different things. It's always good to check. Okay, so there's no there's no good API or anything that you guys can integrate with. To, there, to there's no question. API. Okay, cool. Not yet. Okay, and I think we're finishing exactly on time. Um, thanks so much, everybody. We are we have a vendor booth downstairs, so feel free to come by and buy some kits.